Welcome back, everybody. Uh, for the newcomers, uh, please allow me some technical information. We are streaming our event both in um, English and in Hungarian. If you go on our website, and uh, you will find English on top and Hungarian on bottom. I will um, say this now in, for the Hungarian speakers as well in Hungarian. Um, kedves nézőim, üdvözöllek, üdvözöllünk Önöket uh, újra itt köztünk. A holapunkon um, ma angolul és magyarul is streamingeljük a hallottakat, látottakat. Hogyha legörgetnek, akkor uh, a magyar nyelvű streamet uh, kicsit lejjebb találják. Um, I will now uh, slowly pass on the floor to Kristina Wagner, who will be the moderator of the discussion. Kristina is currently leading the environmental unit at the Hungarian National Railway Railways. Kristina is a lawyer by training and specializing in environmental law. She's also an international waste management expert and as such works on several national and international projects to support legal and practical adaptation of best available solutions in waste management. Kristina, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Welcome everybody in this, I have to say nowadays usual circumstances. Uh, I'm quite unhappy not to have all of our speakers, all of, all of the wise men around me in person, because I was hoping to meet them uh, and have the usual very hot topics discussed face to face, but um, hopefully we will manage to do that next April when we try to reschedule uh, Eco Industry. Uh, I do hope the virus thinks so also. And I'm also happy that we have a resilient system so that we can stream and we can connect everybody and still talk about the most important issues uh, of the present days, or some of them, because I, I think we have so many issues we have just discussed before we have started, that we only have 75 minutes. And knowing the speakers and knowing me, well, we can individually talk 75 minutes about each and every subject, but I try to keep coming from the railways. Timing is very important, so I will try to keep the pace and I will try to keep timing. Uh, please help me in this with sending some questions because 60 minutes is for us, but then 15 minutes is for you guys seeing us and we don't see you. Uh, then the floor will be yours and I would be really happy to deliver the questions to any or all of the presenters here now. Um, you could read about us and you could hear about me. It sounds very strange knowing that I'm so important, uh, but still, uh, let's start. And we start, I was thinking to warm up the floor a little bit with some quick questions. Quick questions would mean that I will uh, raise a question and each and every body would have one answer, one, one sentence on one word to answer. No explanations, we will go deeper later on, but to warm up a little bit and get the feeling of discussing. Okay, so Antonis, Bernard and Ivan, the first question is, basically we can see we could hear from Antonis' presentation and we all know that waste management is a global issue which is at present solved on a national level, let's say solved. So. What do you think, globalization or nationalization in waste management is a better solution? Ivan, let's start with you. Uh, let, me ask, let me ask you back, is European Union global? Actually, you cannot ask back, that was the first uh, okay. rule, you will answer. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay then uh, being as a European, the answer is European global le uh, legislation, but local acting. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Bernard, what do you think? Globalization or nationalization in waste management is the solution? Hi, good morning all. I think what you have seen over the last 20 years is that globalization has reached the limits and we need to uh, invest in infrastructure in uh, Europe. Uh, the big question and the big challenge is where do we put all the, ma all the material which we will recycle? apart from, let's say, prevention. So if there is not a market where we can actually use the materials, uh, the easy way out will be to ship it again to other places. So I think it's, it's the, the, a joint uh, effort to actually make those markets. Okay, and Antonis, finally, globalization or nationalization in waste management, what do you think? Well, I think that one element that is usually um, not recognized is that 
our waste management streams, they have a lot of a global footprint on them. This is because of the global trade. Things that are constructed uh, in one place of the world are sold to another. As an example, you found that 80% of the world's mobile phones are constructed in China, but still as if waste, they become waste to each and every country who use them. So I would say that national waste management systems are required, but still they, they will have the globalization footprint on that, not only in the waste streams, but also in the need to manage recyclables as uh, it was already said. Just to remind all of you, what I was asking for is a one-word answer. <laughs> I'm sorry to say so. Uh, can you hear me now? Uh, there is something. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, so the second question, please be as short as you can. We are, we are uh, tough in time. So we are fighting against plastic. Plastic will be the second main issue we will be discussing here uh, during our time. Uh, very quickly, is plastic a curse or a blessing? One word. Ivan? That we can substitute, it's okay. Three words. <laughs> I know. That we not reuse. Okay. Bernard? Blessing when properly used. Honest? Not a curse, not a blessing. It's a material that we depend on and we need to find new ways to use it. Thank you very much. We are much closer to what I was thinking. Thank you. Uh, let's try with the third question. We, we won't have very much uh, uh, a lot of warming up questions, so it's okay. By the end, we will be uh, black belted in that. Okay, so circular economy is nowadays the new keyword, right? So, but as we see, it is again, as Antonis also said, and we also uh, questioned about waste management mostly, which is basically the end of a product's life, life cycle. Is this okay so? Ivan, again, you please. Not okay, but this is the situation so far. Okay, Bernard. Redesign is badly needed at the beginning of the circle. The circle. Okay, Antonis. If we restrict circular economy to the end of life, then we lose 95% of the potential. Okay, thank you very much. So now that we are hopefully warmed up, and we are closer to uh, the one, one word, one sentence answer. This will be your time to shine. Uh, so I wouldn't ask you to be very brief. I would ask you to be brief, but not very brief. And the first topic areas, which is basically the biggest topic areas, we are trying to come from a holistic approach towards the Hungarian situation a tiny bit, if we will have time, is about the European Green Deal. Um, this is something new, this is, this is hot, hot from the oven, uh, but my first question is how is it better or different from any of the previous plans, action plans, deals, whatever we had so far? Because Europe has always been good in creating plans, but now there is this green deal. What is the difference? Is it better? Let's start from, the, from backwards now. Antonis? Okay, I think that uh this is a serious change, at least in the declared policies. Because the change is not only the EU action plan, but it's also the fact that the new commission said that the European Union policies, they have two major pillars, to fight climate change and circular economy. And as I explained already, these two pillars are very well connected to each other. I mean, actually, achieving circular economy is a condition against the fight for the fight to, of global warming. Now, what is new? I think there are three new elements. First is that at least in the first declarations and the official policy papers, EU is trying to expand circular economy, not only in the waste management and recycling, but uh, much beyond that. Second, uh, the problem I find here is that targets that are very well described and measurable are put only for the waste management sector. So this is not new. It's an advance of the policy we already have. The third thing that I, see, I think is new is that circular economy uh, action plan will be the guideline and uh, the major pillar for the new funding period. So I cannot say from now what will be the results, but hopefully, we will have something that will change a lot 
recycling activities in the waste management sector and start stimulating a change to the industry, which is the main thing we need to do. But for that, we don't still have the tangible targets that are available for waste. I want to finish with that. It's very clear that targets for waste are much more tangible and measurable because they have to go through the public sector under the public governance and supervision. But that's the easy thing to do. This is the low hanging fruit. We have to develop similar targets for all the industries if we want to deliver a serious change. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, also coming from this perspective, Bernard, uh, do you think that, let's say we have the Green Deal and we are, we will talk about a little bit uh, the, the ideas and practice colliding, but on a global scale, if EU manages to reach the Green Deal and put it onto a practical level, will it have an enough, big enough global effect or what could be the global effect of the European Green Deal? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I, I normally always come when I come to states and say, listen, I was already born in a country which is below sea level. So global warming and, and melting icebergs are of special concern to the people in the Netherlands and of course around the world. Um, the Green Deal as such will certainly have a big impact, I would say, also globally. But we have a challenge, and, and one of the, in one of the discussions I had where also Frans Timmermans, the vice president, was present, I actually raised a question to him. I said, the EU has had very good waste management legislation already in the, in the early 2000s. Uh, take, for example, the landfill ban or the uh, packaging and packaging waste directive and the, the waste framework directive. But half the member states have not implemented it, let alone enforced it. So. What is the challenge for the European Commission is not the Green Deal plan, because I think that's a great plan. But how are you going to do it? Will the member states actually be supporting it and implement it and enforce it? And there I have my challenge, uh, my, some serious doubts. We don't see enough money made available to actually make the infrastructure which is needed. Uh, there's not enough focus on um, transition to use more recycled, in this case, for example, plastic or materials. In the end, if you want to do a circular economy, you have to live with the fact that you will stop using fresh materials. So you have to really close the circles, which means a completely different way of collection. Apart from prevention, apart from redesign, the waste management structures as we know them today are obsolete. We need to modernize them. And then I think Europe has a few steps ahead of the rest of the world. So let's also export our technologies and learnings to the, to the rest of the world and let them adapt them to the national circumstances. Okay, talk about national circumstances. Um, Ivan, what would be your hope? Or Because we don't have a practice yet. Uh, but ideas, plans and practice are usually colliding. We were been talking about this uh, before we started this discussion. But regarding the green, uh, green Deal, how do you think that in practice it could help to end the business as usual, as Antonis has said it? Honestly, hello. Honestly, uh, just, just coming back to Bernard a little bit, and after I'm coming to you as well. So Europe was always a leader in the global scheme, if you talk about uh, waste management, if you talk about plastic recycling. Uh, so I'm positive that, uh, and coming back to you, I'm positive that over here we can deal with the ordeal. Uh, honestly, the Green Deal is perfect, but how are we going to make it? There are question marks, huge ones. Uh, Financial situation is just one thing. Who's going to pay for that? It's just one thing. The other thing, what we're going to do with the historical waste already, which is also a huge question mark to me. Uh, there are techniques out there. Not of them are beneficial from the financial point of view. So there is need for research and development, for sure. And also, we have to somehow collect all the potential knowledge around the world because as you can see for example in Holland they actually dig out the pipes and they recycle it over here we don't so 
we should go to Holland and see how they're going to actually clean up the pipes, whatever they dig out from the field, and we should inter uh, interpret it dif absolutely directly from them. Okay. Uh, we are already approaching a very important question, which is usually the question in EU policy, uh, is that the role of the member states, when we have unified rules, uh, but at the same time, we have very different economic, political, behavioral setups uh, of, of nations, of regions, and so on. Antonis, what do you think? What could be the, 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 the best role of a member state within this? How unified these rules should be? Uh, and how do you break it down to the member state level? Well, this is uh, the million dollar question. I think this is a problem that... Uh, is uh, defining the EU discussions for the last 20 years. And we are still uh, far from finding the right answer. Let me start with this. First of all, I don't think that we need necessarily uniform quantified targets for all the member states. I think that the target should be different for the industrialized countries different for the ones that are not so much industrialized. And this is because they have different economies. If you go to circular economy, you know, a circular economy must not, not be circular. Mainly, it has to be economy. It has to be an economy that provides prosperity for the people. It provides profits for business. And it's sustainable economically, environmentally, and socially. This cannot be achieved if Greece and Germany have the same targets. There's no way to do that unless you govern EU, not as a sum of member states, but as an entity that is all around governed with different, with uh, the same rules and the same conditions. But this is not the case. We are far away from that. I believe, and this is my personal opinion, of course, that you cannot apply the same discipline that they want to apply in fiscal policies and finance to waste management and recycling policies. And the more we are trying to do that, what's happening is that the gap between the South and the North is opening. And then the more we are trying and we insist to increase the targets, what's happening is that we make the poorer parts of EU, of EU uh, to increase the distance from the targets. And the only way to cover them is to get dependent and copy paste things from advanced countries, which usually do not work. So I think it's a serious mistake and we need to reconsider that. I also believe, and I want to finish with that, that when you talk about circular economy, circular economy in Hungary and Greece will be completely different than circular economy in Portugal and Germany. Because the economies are different. We are talking about the economies. We are not talking just for the waste sector. So that should be recognized in the way targets and plans should be developed. seriously raising his hand and I can see he's shaking to comment on it. Please do that. So, and please do comment on each other if you wish to. I don't want to limit you in that. It's a, it's a nice approach to have different ideas. To warm up. Yeah, no, no, we are, we are through that. Yeah. Uh, are we going to consider European Union as a united market? If yes, we do have global players. Whether we like or not. Uh, those global players can make and produce a product in Holland or in Greece, but distribute and sell the products around Europe, right? So that global player or that global players must somehow, again coming back from the, to the finance, must somehow finance collection and, and, and uh, waste recovery, let me put on that way, okay? Uh, if we do have different uh, targets for different member countries, uh, unfortunately, we're going to face uh, to number crunching, which means that over here, we can show that we are the best, although it's not true. Why are we the best? Because we actually export to neighbor countries our waste. So I would consider Europe as a united market. This is how I feel. 
What do you think, Bernard? So this is, this is again the globalization, nationalization issue, and that's why I was raising it a little bit, if, if we think EU uh, as, as global, but still around it. Uh, is this such, a, such an uh, important issue to have a single market yes. in this respect? Yes, it's, cru it's crucial, and, and I agree with Ivan, and I unfortunately disagree with Antonis. We, need, we don't need a Europe of two or three speeds. What we do recognize is, of course, that developments in, in the northern part of Europe may have gone quicker and that we have uh, had uh, put more money in it. I think the challenge for Europe is now to bring the technologies which we have developed in the northern part as soon as possible to the eastern and to the southern part of Europe. And that should be the target. I can maybe improve 1 or 2% in the Netherlands, but I can improve 40% in Greece or maybe in Bulgaria by just investing into high-tech recycling plants if you focus just on recycling plants and on, on sorting plants. Um, so let's embrace that. I would love to have all the people in Europe having access to the same type of infrastructure for waste management and recycling. And of course, we also need to work on creating jobs in those countries to actually make raw materials out of this waste and apply that into a converting market. So. Investing in the clever investment will create jobs and will create economic prosperity in also those countries which need it even more than the northern part. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so, Antonis, you have already said uh, that some things are missing from the from the Green Deal. Can you can you give us more example? What do you think? What are you missing personally from the Green Deal? And I would, I would like all three of you to answer this question. What is missing from the Green Deal? For me, and I want to just to follow up with the previous discussion, I want to make clear, if we want to face the European Union as a common market, then this common market has producers and consumers. And the truth is that big part of the industrial production is in the north, part of the consumption is in the south without any production. So if you want to use it as a common market, okay, fine. Put a level, put a target like material circularity per, econ per economy, like a common. Let's say that we want a material circularity of 10% or 15% in all countries. But let them find what is the right mix to do it. That's my point. Now, coming back to your question, Christina, I think that I missed three things from this uh, deal, the Green Deal. First, I missed special emphasis to social uh, dimension. You know, Europe is one of the uh, entities in the world that promotes sustainable development in a lot of ways. But, however, sometimes when we talk about circular economy, we miss that circularities do not only concern materials, they concern human rights, environmental footprint, and financial as well. So I would like to have a green deal with much more emphasis on the social aspects, especially during this period. Second, I think that we need to work on metrics. I'm not saying that we don't have metrics. I'm saying that the metrics we have are very preliminary and not necessarily reflecting the level of circular uh, loops we want and the way we measure them. Let me give you an example. I believe that we need to work a lot of metrics and substitute all the metrics we have about recycling. When you say recycle paper by 40%, what do you mean? That out of the 100 kilos of paper that we found in waste streams, we are able to recover 40. But if you move to circular economy, the denominator should not be how much waste paper we have. The denominator should be how much paper you use in your economy. If you do that, this 40% will become 10 or 15. So if you want the Green Deal to be realized in a tangible way, we need substantial advances in the way we measure. Last but not least, I think the new EU Green Deal is required very, very fast to be transformed in some emblematic tangible projects that will give everyone the idea what it means practically. As long as these projects are not in place yet, some of them I know they are starting, it's difficult for people to understand the importance, which I believe it's very, it's a very transformative process. Thank you, Bernard. What's your opinion about this question? I, I, agree. 
I agree with Antonis on, on, on the social uh, part. I think there are there's certainly uh, things we need to do. Well, for me, the one big, big missing link, and that has to do a little bit with implementation and enforcement and how to finance, is and, and now make also a link to the Green Deal and the climate change. Uh, we know in the case, for example, of plastic recyclate, if we replace virgin plastic with plastic recyclate for the same applications, we save 30 to 40 percent CO2 emission. This CO2 emission savings are not valued in a financial way. Um, so, but in every or in a lot of uh, European legislation, you see the polluter pays, the polluter pays, the polluter doesn't pay, the consumer pays. So, I think we need political courage to break through these kind of discussions and to see really what can bring the economy forward. If we continue just to adapt a linear system, just a little bit here and a little bit there, we're not going to go there. Some we just have to be disruptive. And I think uh, a political decision making on how to value CO2 uh, both ways might have a huge impact. The second thing, we look, if you look for example at packaging waste, uh, single-use plastic packaging waste, it deal is dealt with by, by the green dot systems. Um, what we see, for example, now in the Netherlands is finally that p uh, producers or converters who actually use recyclates in their packaging may get a lower contribution to the packaging uh, fees. So that's a stimulus. So let's not only look at penalties, but look at stimulus and, and how to positively get into a more circular way of working. Ivan, uh, coming from the top, going down a little bit. From the pot, uh, from the top, uh, I do believe that circular economy can be actually realized if we initiate a market for recycled material. Okay, without initiating a market to the recycled material, we never have a closed loop for sure. How can we do that? That's an, a question mark. Whether it's going to be a directive coming from the top uh, lawyers, or it's going to be a social need which actually pull the market. Uh, I believe in both. So basically, there we have to actually push the feelings up about uh, the, the public's feelings up a little bit, no doubt about. But at the same time, we have to, from the legal point of view, we have to encourage. Uh, the devil is somewhere, somehow is still hidden in my opinion. So coming to the realization point of view, how are we going to make it? Uh, since we don't have clear definitions, we, do, we didn't uh, define uh, all the waste streams, okay? Uh, and we even don't know many waste streams coming in the, in the future, like with solar panel for example, we can talk about the historical uh, waste streams, which is perfect, which is perfect, but uh, what will happen in the future wastes? We don't have any solution even for the recycling yet. Uh, this is what we should actually pre-act and uh, be a little bit more active on. Okay, we are coming to uh, coming coming down to the practices of waste management again. But as we have discussed and as we have heard, so basically the Green Deal shouldn't be only about waste management. That's the end of the life cycle. That's the end of the road. Uh, we should start something somewhere earlier. And as far as I have uh, managed to read the Green Deal and uh, the previous actions so far. Uh, we are, and the devil lies in details, of course, uh, we always talked about eco-design, we always talked about uh, prevention, but practically, how, how, can we, how can we make corporations, product makers, production companies, uh, really do eco-design, and how can we, how can we force them or, or incentivize them for preventions? Because we have heard uh, the very good practice of Apple, which is an economic-based decision to have uh, their own recycling facility, as we would name it. Maybe it's not that, but what's the role of corporations in the Green Deal and in the practice, what we are learning, and what is different from the present? Okay, so let's not talk about waste management now. Let's talk about the production stage in this respect, Ivan, let's start with you now again. You are provoking, right? Of course. <laughs> I'm trying uh, my best. Honestly, eco-design is lovely. Lovely. Uh, 
First question, who initiated it? Uh, question mark, and it's a theoretical question. Uh, Eco-design doesn't talk about recycled content. It talks about recyclability. Uh, honestly with you, everything is recyclable. It's just a question of money. Uh, so basically, eco-design should focus on recycled content. And we are coming back to the previous question, where we have a pool market to the economy. Uh, eco-design as a basic can work, but it's not obligatory for all the for all the stakeholders yet. Whether it's going to be obligation, it's it's okay. It can work. If it's not obligation, we are going to have uncertainties, and we are not going to measure the stakeholders on the same way. Okay, but Bernard. Um do you agree? So do you think that uh, eco-design should be regulated or there should be, uh, the corporations should act as they want because of something else? Uh, and how does the Green Deal affect this, maybe, if I can raise like 10 questions in these two? So eco-design technically is regulated. It's simply not working, um, as, at, at least uh, for the time being. Um, you've heard about the, the, the thing like called extended producer responsibility. And I think this is a tool which could be much more powerful. Uh, for me, it is obvious, and certainly when we talk about going more circular, that any producer of any product put on the market, and whether this is glass or metal or paper or textile, will have the obligation to reuse that's the waste of that same material back into their products one day down the line. And for one product that could be in three months, for another product that could be after 20 years. But that obligation, one way or another, has to be linked to. And then, if people have to consume their own waste, if you want, they will certainly start looking at the quality of, of what they put in the market. And then you will automatically uh, trigger what we then call eco-design. As long as we don't make people responsible for their acts of what they put in the market and they just buy uh, with some money, uh, give some fees somewhere down the line to waste management to get rid of it, it's not going to work. So it actually, if we put a bottle on the market, it has to go back to a bottle, preferably. And if it cannot go back to a bottle for whatever reason, at least the people who make the bottle are responsible for finding a new product in which you put it. And this may sound very simple and it may be very far away from what we will realize in the short term. For me, it's it's basically the only way it's going to work. And you see the European Commission has already reacted a little bit on that in some mandatory content for some products. But if you, as an example for the PET bottle, I mean, already 10 years ago, we could make 100% recycled content PET bottles with food grade, but the law just puts 25% in. So uh, legislation is always behind the, the industry in that sense, and that's not that's not uh, too bad to worry. But the technologies are already there for a lot of issues, and some product simply has to be redesigned and or disappear from the market. What do you think, Anton? Is um, the role of corporations again on a global, on a European, on a national level? How can they contribute to prevention, and sh what should be the relationship between the EU state regulations and the corporations, so how can they contribute to the Green Deal? First of all, I want to agree with uh, Bernard. I think that uh, one thing that for sure should be an element of any discussion and any solution and any policy is to expand extended producer responsibility to many of the products, to make extended producer responsibility much more suitable to circular economy rather than recycling practices. However, I think I have to be very frank. I don't believe that corporations can stimulate circular economy on a global scale, not even on a European one. And this is why today profits are mostly in the linear business model. As long as profits are in the linear business model, only pioneers and exceptions will move to circular models. And to resolve these problems, we need some kind of stained intervention. Not necessarily to define exactly what is eco design or what is the right material, but create a to create a framework that will help the transition to circular practices and make them more compatible and more competitive to the linear ones. I think this is the kind of interventions we need uh, from the state. 
Now, on the other side, I think it's very clear that we have to recognize that worldwide we have two different ways to work. If you go to China as an example, what they call circular economy is actually a top-down approach. It's an approach that starts from the government and goes to the latest company and puts obligations and mandatory issues. Here in Europe, we follow a different path. We have a framework for the public sector, and then we are trying to create incentives from the private sector to follow and deliver innovation. I think this second part should be substantially increased in the next years. And this requires new forms of governance that still are not available because it's a governance much closer to a hybrid public-private partnership rather than the typical public sector uh, activities we know. Okay, um, Ivan, yeah, just, sure, please. Just, just shortly. Uh, we are talking about here responsibility, uh, profit maximization. The, the, the colleagues simply do know, but maybe not the public, who is one of the largest PET bottle recycler in Europe nowadays. Please with us. Am I right? So Lidl actually bought already PET battery recycling plant. Uh, whether you can call it vertical integration or you can call it closed loop, uh, but actually we can call it circular economy as well. So we see examples already, at least on our field, okay? Or uh, we can say Bolera, 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 Bolera sorry, the, one of the largest uh, virgin material producer started up already recycling and bought up companies to recycle. So they are actually aware, and if they see profit in it, they jump onto. So we still, uh, our God is still profits, right? So this yes. is what leads us. Nothing has changed. Okay, so let's show me let, the money. Yeah, show me the money. Um, and you just, all, all three of you pushed my red button with extended producer responsibility, so it wasn't in the questions, but I cannot not ask you about extended produ producer responsibility. Um, now it's defined in the EU laws, finally, from last year, they have put something in the EU legislation, what extended producer responsibility really means for the EU. And it says financial and organizational obligations, but each and every member states define their own system, understand it in the way they want to, adopt it in a way they want to, in a global market. Uh, is it okay? Do you think it's, uh, this is extended? What is extended producer responsibility? That's the first. Not on a theoretical level, in a practical level, what you think extended producer responsibility should be. And second, on a legislative basis, again, globalization, nationalization, is the present EU legislation enough to set a unified approach or an approach that will deliver practical good things for us or not? Bernard, let's start with you now. Ooh, now you have a lot of questions in one. Uh, extended, let's, let's just take an example outside of packaging. Uh, you just buy a mattress and you use that mattress for a certain moment of time and after one, 10 years or 20 years or whatever, you have to bring it back. Uh, will you be able to convert a mattress into a mattress? Uh, not automatically. I mean, there are some examples where they've tried. But what we have seen, for example, in the Netherlands, uh, a company called Alping is now coming out with a first circular uh, mattress. And there are other things to think about. They may not sell the mattress anymore. They may give it to you or lease it to you or rent it to you and you just bring it back. So I can imagine that, let's say, in white goods, or uh, you don't buy a washing machine anymore, you will just rent it and after 10 years it goes back and you get a new one and they use parts of the old ones to, to repair or to refurbish or whatever. Um, once producers are starting to do that, they will certainly invest heavily in the quality of the raw materials. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, so we need a transition of, of, of businesses. Um, and ownership is no longer a must. When I was a kid, my first dream when I was 18 was to buy a car. If you ask today a youngster of 18, they want the latest model of an iPhone or a, or a computer or something else. 
and if you live in, in downtown Amsterdam and probably also in Budapest, there's no way to park your car anymore. So why do you need a car? You just rent it when you need it and you just take it or you have an on-the-go uh, scooter. So the generations of today are not so much into ownership as the generation of my, of my age. And I think that's also something where, where you will see, um, take an example of Tesla, whatever you think about the car itself and about the issues on the batteries and end of life, it has changed a very conservative automotive industry which has not done a lot of developments over the last 30, 40 years in, in, in car motors. I mean, it is disruptive. Yeah? I'm not saying it's everything what they've done is good, but it has given a different view on uh, how circularity and how mobility is, is organized. And I think these, these examples will come much more and they need to come much more. Okay, Antonis, what do you think about extended producer responsibility? Uh, I think, first of all, that uh, there are two levels to discuss about it. One level is the level that Bernard already mentioned. Already mentioned. I mean, we have to beyond that. We have to rethink the basic business models for many, many industries. Tesla did, and as it happened already to the tourism industry and stuff like this. Now, rethinking these business models, we may found out that ownership is not necessarily the condition. And circular business models are a big part of the solution. Now, if we move to extended producer responsibility, I think that we have two, two shifts to make. First, for me, for some products, especially the ones that can involve a lot of hazardous materials or a lot of valuable materials, we need to open the way for a global extended producer responsibility rather than a national one. And I know this is pretty difficult. It has a lot of uh, geographical and technological barriers, but I cannot see any other way to apply it for big companies. I don't understand why Apple applies a lot of recycling programs to USA and they do not apply them in Greece or in Turkey. We have to find a way to deal with Apple and Apple is much stronger than any individual European state, but not necessarily stronger than the EU as a whole. I think this is one shift and we have to be very careful to apply it for special waste streams. The second thing is that I think we have also to question how successful are our traditional EPR systems as an example in packaging. Are they EPR systems towards a circular view or they are just collecting mixed recyclables with low value? This is something that is not resolved in European Union. And we know very well that in some cases they are towards the second option because the second option is less demanding and more cheap. So I want to finish saying this. I'm sure you know that in European Union, there is a big debate now again about extended producer responsibility against uh, return uh, and deposit schemes. You don't have to be dogmatic. I th actually, to my understanding, these two systems can support each other and they can work together. But for that, you need a proper framework. So instead of fighting, which is the best one or the other, let's try to see that both of them, they cover different needs. And if you create a proper framework, both of them, they can work in a tandem way and optimize the performance. Okay, Ivan. I agree 100%. Collection is the key. So recycling can be done uh, relatively easily. If it's collected properly, the collected waste can, can, can be used up relatively easily. Uh, just coming back to Bernard's uh, example to Tesla. Tesla actually solved the problem uh, of the batteries since they burn out time to time. So it's called energy recovery, right? <laughs> So Tesla, Tesla actually solved on, on site already. Uh, I, we can see also next to the Matvis uh, uh, example, Ica started up already something. So Ica actually collecting back already the furnitures and, and all, all the goods they sell. So the collection is centralized from Ica point of view. And that's the same with Lidl and with the PET battles. So. We have to focus on collection, uh, whether who is going to pay for 
that's another question again. But the collection is the crucial thing, in my opinion, here. Okay. Um, can I be provocative again? Are you sure it's not production? It's collection that matters the most? Because for me, what, I, what we can see, actually, from I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm sorry to say this, I'm sometimes ashamed that lawyers are not always well received, but uh, what we can see is that into productions, EU doesn't like to touch this issue on, on regulating productions. Uh, the single-use plastic directive, which, we, which is our second topic area uh, today, is actually, besides of course hazardous ma uh, materials, is the first directive where they say don't use this material for certain purposes. Do you think uh, regulating productions is first of all possible, second is a good tool. Uh, what, what can you see uh, as, as global players in this respect? Let's start again with you, Ivan. Regulation can be done, whether it can be uh, pushed to do it, it's a question mark. We are talking about EU just now. Uh, what happens if uh, if you the plastic straw, you make it in Ukraine, and you actually, it's again a question mark. Uh, soup as the single-use plastic, whatever we can uh, easily substitute, I agree 100%, no doubt about. Uh, but there are there are actually parts pretty difficult to substitute. Also, where is the border? Are we going to say that, okay, the automotive industry must be regulated? Uh, are we going to be the, the, the barrier of development? If you actually, I mean, it's a theoretical questions, but um, you, can, you, can, you can think of that. Okay, Antonis, do you think we can or we should regulate productions in this matter, in this manner, like uh, regulating them on the on the material use uh, for preventional issues, for for any, any other issues? Well, my answer is straightforward. Yes, we should do. The purpose of markets is to create profits. It's not to deliver environmental protection or health protection. This is the purpose of governments. The purpose of the public sector and it should not be afraid to regulate. Let me give you an example. As Lord Stern said, climate change is the result of the biggest market failure ever. Market will never be able to resolve the problem of climate change itself without proper regulations. If you remember 20, 30 years ago, we have the problem with ozone depletion. How it was resolved? Regulating the use of materials and air and uh, gazes. So we will not be afraid to regulate. But now there is another condition to regulate properly. Because Ivan is right. What if we regulate something in Europe and the rest of the world is not regulating this? Then you lose competitive power. You lose part of the economy. So some problems, either they will be resolved in a coordinated way in a global scale, or every effort to resolve it locally will create new dynamics that will undermine the solution. What do you think, uh, like with the single-use plastic directive, is it a good tool? Is it really useful? Or is just because a lot of people says it's good for communication because a lot of people see a lot of whales and uh, sea animals with plastic straws and so on. So we had to regulate it. Or it's just a good trial from the EU. What do you think about this? Um, I'm not sure whether you are aware, but I'm also the founder of uh, an NGO called Waste Free Oceans. Uh, we tried to, of course, stop uh, material entering the waterways and there were possible clean it up. Uh, we've also been involved in, uh, in Hungary and I was part of the, the, the Pet Cup last year to collect the bottles from uh, the Tisa River together with uh, some of the organizers of today. Um, so I understand why, why things are if you look at what, what's regulated only is the top 10 most little items. Um, it's, I think, more than looking just at those 10 items, it is a, it's a flag and a signal from the authorities to the industry. If you don't put your act together, we will help you to do that. So please see it as a warning. Uh, can we live without a straw in a cocktail? I would say yes. Uh, is it clever to put the caps together with a PET bottle? Yes, because we did the same with the cans. 
10, 15 years ago when the cans and the lids were uh, separate. So that's 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 development. Uh, can we uh, do something with the cigarette butts which we find on every corner of the street? Yes, we should. And should the tobacco industry be part of that in a certain way? Yes, and maybe on the on financing side of that. Uh, the second uh, largest one is chewing gum. Chewing gum is not regulated yet. Can we regulate everything? No. But will these kind of actions from a political level also lead to a kind of harmonization and standardization of some products? I hope so. I really hope so. And then it, we'll link it back to the discussion earlier on eco-design. Um, more strong, more strong, and this is simply a, to a topic we need to look at. Can we ask the consumers of Europe to not only buy with their hearts, but also with their wallets? And just start to buy the products which have less environmental impact. How can you do that in a, in, a, in a supermarket chain? Do you need every time something which is packed? There are supermarkets without packaging. Uh, do you, uh, can you use, uh, do you go for fast fashion or do you use your, your clothes uh, a bit longer? And, and I know there are parts of Europe maybe when, where money is, but if 10 or 15% of the population are already starts doing that, we will see a change at the retailers and the brand owners. They will start to realize that they have to change their way of acting as well. So it, it goes both ways. Standardization and harmonization, and I agree with Antonis and with, with Ivan, it doesn't go without regulations. An industry had had 20, 30 years to actually regulate it themselves. They haven't done it. So I think it's time for the legislator to take part. Okay, just just for my colleagues, I would ask them, that we have a graph about plastics, can we put it out so that if the viewers are not that much deep into plastic issues, then they could see what we are really talking about in plastic streams. If we could put it out for uh, a couple of minutes, that would be lovely. And I would ask Ivan, because uh, he's again eager yeah, to contribute no, 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 to this no, 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 subject, just, please, just, please just, share your opinion. Just to, to ensure, one thing that we always forget, the lobby power of the big players. Uh, SOP just now actually talks about the plastic packaging and single use plastic, but never talks about PT bottles. Uh, just coming back to this free ocean, uh, Bernard, would you please tell us what is the portion of the PT bottle in, uh, in, in the waste in, 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 in the ocean? Well, in, the plastic. in the ocean, in the ocean it's, it's probably a little bit more difficult, but closer to land and to, on the beaches. Uh, just a, an example which is close by, uh, you're probably looking at it, the Danube. Um, as you know, we, we started to collect uh, some waste streams out of the Danube a couple of years ago already uh, and actually found a picture back last uh, <laughs> last week where I, I found you and, and myself, uh, much younger even. Um, last year in Bulgaria uh, and Romania, uh, we took out over 1 million PET bottles and I'm sure we just had the tip of the iceberg. I think with the, the pet Koopa, uh, but Gary and the others will certainly be better uh, judges to, to say that, I think there were two or 300,000 bottles just picked out of. Uh, we didn't see too much other litter than, than bottles. That can easily be solved by implementing a deposit return system. Yeah. In those countries where we, we have those systems, you see hardly any bottles or cans on the street. So that's political decision making, which can be easily stop littering. In the end, of course, there is a role for the consumer because they throw it away. Um, if you go to the deep sea, you don't see the bottles because most of them are actually on the bottom probably because the lids are off. But on the beaches, it, it's a high percentage. And it's in the top 10, that's why it's regulated. But there's no need because PET bottles are very good material. You can use them again and again. You just have to properly collect them. And the same goes for shopping bags. The same goes for all the others. It's not a, it's not the material. It's the way we handle waste. And we have no value and no sense of value to the waste streams. You don't throw away your mobile phone. So why would you tip away a PET bottle or, or a, a crisp bag or, or a shopping bag? That's because you don't perceive value. And you don't... Graph. So, sorry. Yeah. No, and, and we don't see, and I think that's also a role for the, for the public services. Uh, we had a debate in the Netherlands uh, when uh, the, the ambassador said this morning, uh, the, the, the Netherlands have an ambition to go circular by 2050. And I was interviewed by the Dutch television uh, in the very early days of that statement. 
And one of my statements was if the Dutch uh, cities and, and uh, communes cannot even order their waste bins and waste bags out of recycled plastic, we are far away from circular. Uh, the first day, uh, of course, there was a, <laughs> a lot of rumor and the green dot system that I was full of something. Um, the day after the communes, the cities called, they said, you got a point, let's sit together, let's do it. Um, today we have what we call a circular wheelie bin. Uh, which is used in many authorities, which has at least 80% recycling content. It's simply doing it. It's not It's not magic. It is bringing the right people together. But sometimes you need people who just uh, throw a stone in the water and, and make it happen. And uh, we, had, we have thro had to throw a lot of stones, unfortunately. And we have to keep on throwing stones because it's simply not happening. It's not the technology. It's not the material. It's the way we not do it. Okay, um, let's talk about a little bit about resilience, okay? Because what we could see, and uh, it was also uh, in the previous presentation by Antonis, that the production companies quite quickly adapted to new circumstances. The masks and all kinds of products have been, have been produced very quickly. But resilience is also a question for waste management. Can we create, is it possible at all to create a resilient waste management system, do you think? Uh, let's start with Antonis. We haven't heard him in the last couple of minutes. What do you think, Antonis? I think it is, but um, we have to decide better uh, the targets and the objectives. Of I think that the main problem we have, uh, at least in the south of Europe, as I, as I face it in the last years, is like this. We are, we are making waste management more and more complex. We add new waste streams that need separate management, separate logistics, separate treatment. And that increases substantially the cost of waste management of the public sector and the citizens. Now, as we are doing this, the more complex we make the waste management operations, the more less the, the, the more we reduce its resilience. So as a, a resilient system is the one that can be viable on the long term, even in crisis. And I think that there are two different conclusions from the pandemics re regarding the resilience of our systems. First, in the south of Europe, as I see in many municipalities, we didn't, the, the way to make the system resilient was to reduce some of the services. But why was that? It was because in the south of Europe, a lot of the waste workers have, has, have to stay home. In cases where they did not stay home, they were able after some justification to continue the delivery. So I would say that the European system is not perfect, but it's much more resilient than other systems in the world. And during the pandemics, it delivered high levels of recycling, even with the problems of the uh, protective equipment. On the other side, what we see clearly is that Waste management systems that are based on dump sites and simply landfilling, although they seem resilient, they are not. Because resiliency is not simply to keep the operations going. Resiliency is to protect health environment even in the most difficult conditions. So in a nutshell, I would say that we have to think twice before we increase the complexity of our systems. We have to limit the expansion of our systems to viable operations. And we have to be, to be much more relying on domestic markets than the international one for recyclables. Agree. Do you agree, Bernard? I, I could see you prepare something uh, there before. Talk, <laughs> talk before about COVID. We, we made a reusable COVID mask with recycled plastic, which is available on the website of Waste Free Ocean. So, I mean, uh, if you want to protect your ears, I mean, uh, let me see where's the camera. This you can put behind your head. It's made out of 100% recycled plastic. So, it, I mean, pandemics, if it's not COVID, there will be otherwise. So, uh, but let me give you another example. Um, under the flag of Wage Free Oceans, we have uh, done and, and discussed a lot of projects. I will, I will bring it up also tomorrow during my presentation on, on, on the conference. Um, one of the products we, we looked at is can we make, let's say, social housing uh, out of waste streams? 
uh, instead of people living on the landfill, turning the landfill into something usable and make social housing. What we see now is that uh, more and more countries start to embrace these thoughts. Um, the technologies are there, we can, and, and there is also a discussion, for example, in, in, in the, the Americas, where with the hurricanes we see a lack of wood. So when there is a lack of wood and we, we can replace it by something more sustainable and, and use waste streams to actually replace that wood and make sheets out of uh, mixed plastics or recycled plastics, uh, it, it will be a solution in some cases. Uh, but it doesn't stop us from, from looking at the beginning. And I fully agree with Antonis, is, is, is Europe has invested quite a lot in waste management. But it was waste management to bring waste to, in a linear way from, let's say, uh, the use phase into a landfill and, or into incineration or energy recovery. Um, and I think what we should try to do now is look at those raw materials which are so valid that they can wait to be incinerated uh, and we should stop landfill as soon as possible all around the planet but let's start first in Europe. If you know that there are about 100,000 landfills more or less legal or illegal still operating in Europe at the moment, some of them very close to the rivers, if we take care of those landfills we also have le less leakage into the waterways. So. There's a lot of win-win-win to do, but again, we need political decision-making and, and, and boldness to actually implement and, and, and enforce the legislation which they already uh, approved in 2008. And what do you think about the resilience or the flexibility of the waste management system? Dream? Reality? Possible? Possible? Dream? Uh, could be a reality as well. Uh, Recyclers are followers, actually. So we do follow whatever the virgin material, and from the virgin material, the, the converters make up. Let me give you an example. Uh, you are young, but hopefully you still remember the first Motorola and uh, Nokia and phones. Yeah. OK. Uh, have a guess how many different plastic parts did those mobiles contain at that time? Five. Uh, almost eight or ten. How many different, chemically different plastic parts this small iPhone just now? Twenty. Uh, almost fifty. So basically the complexity is crucial. So if you are asking me as a recycler, I would be happy to dictate the converters to simplify the parts, but certainly there are marketing guys as well. So. Basically, yeah, we try to follow the trends, but uh, we, 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 we should generate uh, a little bit more caution from the converters, let me put it that way. Thank you. Uh, actually, we do have questions, and I'm really happy about it, because the first question is just as if I would put it right now, because it just matches what we are talking about. It's from Jose. And basically the question is, we have more and more types of plastics. How can we control the newest types, preventing reusable and re un uh, unreusable and unrecyclable plastics? How can we do that? Antonis? Well, I think uh, both plastics, we have to consider very clearly that a big part of them simply is not recyclable, it's not made to be recycled. And uh, we have to, I think, we have to stop speaking about plastics in general because there are many, many different types of plastics and some of them are really not uh, uh, easy to be substituted. Let me give you an example about that. We use a lot of plastics in construction. If we, instead of plastics in construction, we use wood or any other material, the environmental impacts and the CO2 footprint would be much more than using plastics. Also, the weight and their static behavior will be much uh, less uh, resilient than it is today. So when you talk about plastics, we have to make a distinction. We have to talk about plastics that are for the long-term use, and I think in this case, these plastics are not easy to be substituted. And we have to, to talk about plastics that are for a more temporary use. And this second case, that the extreme case is single-use plastic, it's something that we can start discussing how to substitute them with different materials under certain conditions. Now, what I believe is that 
we have to redefine, as I said in my presentation, the relationship with this. I don't think that innovation in plastics will not deliver. It will deliver. Somehow it's already delivering and the plastic industry is making a huge effort to redefine its footprint and find new ways. But what we need is to identify which type of plastic materials we need on the long term and which time we can substitute. This is something that requires a global effort. And I'm very happy to see that this global effort has already started from the plastic industry. Okay, what do you think, Bernard? Bernard? I think if you if you look at from a holistic view, there is not more types of plastic than there was before because the, the same building blocks are there. There are still seven or eight families. The only thing what we see happening is that they start to put them together and we get multi-materials in certain applications for functional reasons. Um, and this is the challenge. So it's, it's, if you have just a polyethylene or a, or a polypropylene or a polystyrene as as a modern material, it's pretty easy to recycle if it's properly collected. But if you have a mixture of six or seven different types of plastic all mixed together in a, in a three millimeter or a one millimeter or a 0.5 millimeter film, then the challenges are there. So um, we need to look where it makes sense. What we also saw, and I think Anton has uh, already indicated on that, if you replace uh, let's say a straw by a paper straw with uh, a plastic coating uh, are you really helping the world? No, you're not. Um, if you have long-term applications like sewage pipes or you have building blocks and all those kind of things in the, in, in the construction industry, I think they are very well and it's all, almost all mono material because I think that's the secret. You can recycle certain mixtures but the mixtures in some cases are so complex that there is no market anymore. And a lot of those mixtures are actually in the single use packaging. Uh, but we also see more and more complex mixtures in the, in the waste streams of E&E. &E, so of the electronics and of the, of the phones and of the computers. So we have to go back again on the discussion on design. And we have to, do, to go back again on where is the responsibility of those who put those products in the market. Okay, so we have been taken away by the discussion. We have five more minutes left and I have two very important questions, actually three, one coming from outside and two from me. Ivan, can you just quickly add to this because I could sh see you shaking your head. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, okay. So the next question that's coming from, uh, from one of our viewers, how can we step, look beyond waste management when we are talking about circular economy and the Young Green Deal? We always stick to waste management, what's better? Uh, quite complex issue. Can you quickly answer this? How can we do this? Antonis? Can, can you repeat? Because I, I lost you for a while. I didn't understand the question. Let me, let me ask once again. Uh, how can we step, look beyond waste management when we are talking about uh, uh, circular economy and the EU Green Deal? Uh, we always stick to waste management. What's better? Stick to it or come to something new? Well, we are waste managers, so it's kind of uh, natural to stick to waste management. Also, it's kind of natural because waste management uh, is something very important for our daily lives. And as I said, it's a low hanging fruit. I want to say this just to remove any misunderstanding. In countries that are not industrialized that much, like it is my country, Greece, or it is a big part of the Balkan countries, Waste management is the only way to kickstart a circular approach. But in countries like Germany or Netherlands, where there is a lot of industrialized production, supply chains playing on the long term a much more important role. So if we stick to Eastern Europe and Southeastern Europe, I would say that dealing with waste management and circular economy is probably the first step that we need to do to make waste management a catalyst for the whole economic model. It's not bad at all to start from waste management. What will be bad is to stay just on that and not move further to the supply chains and to the whole economy. So yes, in developing countries in general, trying to deal with waste management and make it more circular could be a catalyst that can generate shifts for the whole economy. That's my opinion. Do you agree, Bernard? To a certain extent, because you can argue about an evolution or a revolution. 
Uh, I think the, the advantage of, of uh, especially the eastern and southern part of Europe is you can skip 20 years of developments which we had to go through in, in the northern part of Europe. So, um, and, and I think it would be a waste of, of energy and, and discussion if we would follow the same route of development. So I, I would welcome all the countries in the east and the southern part of Europe, and especially also outside of Europe, to learn and, and pick up where we are today and not look back 20 years where we started um, and just find the right ways to implement the, the more modern ways of doing it. And, uh, and I think Ivan already mentioned it in the very early stage of this debate, the most critical part of the successful recycling of any material is the way of collecting. The purer the material is collected, the higher quality we can keep and the longer we can keep it very high in the, in the circle economy. And as soon as you start mixing materials or you do commingled collection, your chances go quickly lower. So there's also a challenge to, uh, to really, really look at the way waste management is organized at the moment. In some cases, it goes very well. I mean, a good example is the deposit return systems for, for bottles, for example, where you have 95, 96% pure material. Uh, compared to, let's say, commingled collection where uh, most material ends up in incineration. Okay, Ivan, would you like to add to it? Uh, just a theoretical. Again, waste management as definition used to be absolutely different, let's say, 30 years ago than now. And uh, I bet in a certain amount of money that it's going to be different in 10 or 15 years' uh, time. So waste management as a definition is also changing. Thank you very much. And just to put everything into nice... Uh, frame, I would have two last questions, which I would like to ask three of you to quickly answer in one... Provoking again. Provoking again. Um, the, the first is the nicer one. The festive season is coming, and let me, let me try to make your wishes come true. And I, my wish is to meet all of you in April next year for the second round of discussions. But if we meet, what would you like me to ask you first? Tell me a question which I would have to read next April to you, one by one, when we sit down again. Let's start again with Antonis. What do you want me to ask you when we meet to, uh, next April? I think by next April, Please. the first question that we have to make each other is how our waste management and recycling systems are transformed after uh, 12 months of COVID-19. This could be a very serious impact that we need to discuss in more details. Super. Bernard? Uh, I would love you to raise the question, did we manage to change waste management into resource management? Thank you. Ivan? Unfortunately, in half a year, Bernard, it's not feasible. Uh, uh, I, I do believe that the COVID is the most important issue as well. My question, your question should be whether we started up collecting the sanitary and we started up collecting and recycling that pharmaceutical uh, pandemic used things. Okay, so we have the first three questions for next April. And the last question I would like to raise is that, uh, I don't know if it's visible for you, Bernard and Antonis, but we are just right across our parliament. And uh, if you could send one sentence, one message to the members of the parliament, which would, they will have to listen to, what would be that one very simple sentence you would like us to send to them? Let's start again with you. A very simple message. My message is like this. Create a governmental agenda that will be horizontal and interdisciplinary about circular economy in a broad way and link it with people's prosperity. That's my single message. My message would be uh, go for low hanging fruits, implement deposit return systems on several packaging and work out a long term strategy how we can finance the, the needed infrastructure in a more modern waste management or resource management uh, service in uh, in Hungary and the surrounding countries. Startup, not just talking about, but implementing green procurement. 
that would help us and that would actually help for all the waste and recycling business. Thank you very much. We have listed the questions I would raise to you in next April, and we have listed the sentences we will try to uh, send to the members of our parliament and maybe to other members as well. I thank you very much for this nice conversation. Unfortunately, as predictable as it was, we ran out of time quickly and we have a lot of subject opened, but we also have a high hope to meet next April. Thank you very much for attending this meeting, and I give back the microphone and the floor to you. Thank you, Christina, and uh, thank you for all the panel members um, for your fruitful discussion. I'm happy to hear that you have all the, already some questions that uh, you will be able to kick off with in, in April. We're really looking forward to continuing this discussion with you. So with this, we actually came to the end of the events of the first day. Uh, thank you for spending your time with us. Uh, please don't forget that tomorrow we will have another full day of programs lined up. Um, our international conference, the kickoff event of the TIDIA project, will begin at 9. Uh, we will be focusing on marine and riverine waste. If you haven't registered yet, please make sure you do so. All the relevant information regarding registration um, and the program can be found on the website of the Oko Industria. Um, and with this, I would like to thank all our guests for their insightful thoughts and all of you for joining us today. Um, hope to see you tomorrow and have a very pleasant afternoon.